So my name is Ariel, and I am the Community Growth and Engagement Specialist for Now Included, which is a digital health community platform created by Black people for Black people to help our communities live healthier. Today with me, I have Dr. Ron Bosley, and he's going to tell us a little bit about skin health and the importance of taking care of your skin, as well as debunk some common misconceptions. Thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Ron Bosley. I'm a double board certified dermatologist practicing in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So thank you for doing this. This is fun already. So I'm I'm looking forward to it today. Awesome. Awesome. So first, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about what got you into dermatology and why you wanted to be a dermatologist. Yeah. So medical school was interesting for me because I didn't go into it like absolutely sold on a specialty. Mm -hmm. Um, I was fortunate enough in my third year, which nowadays is a little later for some people, um, to have an experience in dermatology. And I was just blown away. Although it was only two weeks, um, every day of those two weeks was different than the day before. I was seeing kids. I was seeing adults. I was seeing grandparents. I was seeing black people, white people, all skin tones, ethnicities. Um, We were doing surgery, ranging from minor procedures to big skin flaps. And I just felt like, wow, this is I have not been bored at all. And honestly, compared to other specialties, uh, that was refreshing just because some of them just seem very mundane. Uh, and so I decided to, to jump in. I, I spent the rest of my third year in medical school getting, you know, dating specialties, seeing if I liked them and nothing else kind of measured up. So I decided to go into dermatology. That's awesome. Very cool. So speaking when we get into more skin health versus darker skin, what are some common misconceptions that you find that Black people or people with darker skin have about taking care of their skin? Well, I think for um, Black people and other uh, ethnicities and people from various cultures, there's a huge cultural component to skin health and skin care. And so a lot of, um, you know, being raised by a Black mother and father with Black grandparents and cousins, mm-hmm. and, you know, we have our own common things that we use for our skin um, I think growing up, I was fortunate to see a dermatologist who was a black male. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's a very common experience for most people. Yeah, this is my uh, first time ever seeing a black dermatologist. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, I was able to see me. But mm-hmm. for a lot of my friends, you know, dermatology was a luxury. And so I think one of the big misconceptions is that black people don't need dermatologists. I don't know if it's because of lack of access to dermatology, just like there's lack of access to healthcare in general mm-hmm. in black communities. Um, or if some of the cultural aspects that we uh, use, which a lot of them are valid, um, kind of keep us from needing dermatologists. So I would say that's one of the big misconceptions is that black people don't need dermatologists. Why? Because when they think of dermatologists, they might think of skin cancer. Well, black people don't get skin cancer. Big misconception, black people do get skin cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the uh, skin conditions like atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, hydradenitis suppurativa, these are Skin conditions common or disproportionately common in, in black and brown communities. Mm-hmm. Um, some of those are uh, have cultural, social, and economical aspects to them that make the disease uh, worse. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they're going to see their primary care. And so they're not going to see dermatologists. They're going to who they have the best access to. Mm-hmm. And so um, another misconception is that we're not out here. And we are. There's mm-hmm. a lot of us um, here and a lot of us here are also trying to push the envelope and make sure that all dermatologists, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, et cetera, are trained well enough to diagnose skin care or skin disease in black patients. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I'm sure, I mean, just growing up and seeing like textbooks and stuff and talking a little bit about like skin health in general, I didn't really see a lot of people who looked like me reflected in the textbooks. And so it's hard to know exactly what those signs and symptoms might be as someone with darker skin for something like skin cancer. Um, Some of our health topics of interest specifically are parigonodularis and vitiligo. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a black patient come into your practice with either one of those conditions? And if so, what would be the first like signs and symptoms, would you say? Yes. Okay. Um, So especially parigonodularis. So Mm -hmm. for people who don't know what that is, parigonodularis is basically a condition in which people get itchy bumps. Mm -hmm. That condition is usually secondary to another condition, such as atopic dermatitis, commonly called eczema. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of patients that have parigonodules or Mm -hmm. parigonodularis. Um, The first thing, our first sign is what I said, kind of chronic itching, the formation of bumps that occur from scratching, from having this uncontrolled 
uh, rash or dermatitis. Mm -hmm. um, for those patients, it is very important that we educate them and counsel them. A lot of people think they have an infection or they have some type of bug or something that's kind of causing this. And it's like, no, you may have a undiagnosed or undertreated medical condition. And if we can control that, we might be able to control your itch and therefore control your your pryogonodularis. Mm -hmm. Similarly with vitiligo, you know, a lot of there's a lot of misinformation about vitiligo, especially in the black community. Um, everybody has their favorite vitiligo person that they think they know and had it, mm -hmm. but they don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I try to do in my office, if I see signs and symptoms of vitiligo, is A, address it quickly and swiftly and aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, I think socially, having a uh, vitiligo, if people aren't aware, where you have an autoimmune condition in which your melanocytes and which are your pigment making cells are being attacked and therefore you don't make pigment. So people will have white or lighter patches of skin. And for someone who's darker skin, so we call it fish patrick skin types, there's one through six. African Americans, although they can be in the full range of fish patrick types, usually fall in the latter four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And so having a light patch next to a darker skin is just socially um, can be disrupting for, mm -hmm. for patients. So we try to treat it really aggressively. Let them know there's nothing wrong with them. As far as social, you know, enjoy your life. I'm glad nowadays there are people out there that are um, embracing their vitiligo and, mm -hmm. and on TV. And so you can see a young person that might see um, a model per se that has vitiligo. I'm like, wow, that, that's me. and can embrace it a little bit. So mm -hmm. we're here for them. We want to treat them not only their skin, but also their entire health. And that's why I think uh, I appreciate when I have my patients come in and we're able to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think that that's really helpful. Like you said, just having more visibility in general. So people know like, oh, hey, maybe that is something that I should get checked out, which is a lot of what we're doing here now included is just having people share stories, talking to people like yourself um, and encouraging people to say, you know what, I think that I need to take charge of my health in this way. Yes. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. I like the way you said take charge. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important that we are our own advocates for mm -hmm. the patients. and it's. Social media, although it has you know ups and downs and good and bad, I think it has been really helpful in putting out there what conditions that black people have mm -hmm. and that they may not know can be treated or mm -hmm. there are treatments for. Totally, totally. So we did talk a little bit in my appointment. I did have an appointment right before this. Mm -hmm. We talked a bit about hyperpigmentation yeah. and how that shows up quite often, I think, in Black Americans. So you had recommended to me there's topical medication as well as oral medication that somebody mm -hmm. could take, or they can consider something like laser hair removal. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more to that just for, for everybody watching yeah. this? <laughs> so in general, what we, what we describe is a, a conversation that I have with a lot of uh, patients with hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the cases of hyperpigmentation I see are secondary to something, right. acne, mm -hmm chronic rashes, um, ingrown hairs, et cetera. And as a result of trying to treat them, trying to pick at them, trying to manage them, or just not being treated, or I'm sorry, managed in an adequate enough or short enough time, you develop hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. And so the main conversation that I have with everybody is we have to stop whatever caused your hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't stop that, Every, you know, I can, we can do chemical pills. You can follow a TikTok trend and do all these things, mm -hmm. but um, yes, it'll get better for sure, but it'll come back. Mm -hmm. So we need to manage the underlying condition. Mm -hmm. The way we do that usually is a, uh, the way I practice is we usually use a multifaceted approach. We're not only going to decrease the amount of melanin that the skin can uh, lay down in those areas. Mm -hmm. We're also going to do treatments in the office. We're also going to do uh, oral medications if necessary to aggressively treat it. Because mm -hmm. similar to hypo or lighter or depigment skin in vitiligo, mm -hmm. hyperpigmentation can also be uh, socially uh, frustrating for mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I try to be as aggressive as possible with patients with hyperpigmentation. Got it. Interesting. Cool. Thank you for telling all the people about it. For sure. Um, so lastly, what I wanted to do is a little game mm -hmm. called Factor Myth, where I'll tell you a, a colloquial phrase that I or one of my coworkers has heard. And you'll say, you know what, yes, or you know what, absolutely not. So let, let's, let's go it. through it. And then I have so, one for you, too, if you oh, don't ask me already. Okay, okay, All okay. Right. Why don't you start with the one for me? 
I don't want to steal your thunder. Okay. 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 All right. All right. So something that I have heard mm -hmm. often is that you can put alcohol on bumps to dry them out and get rid of them. Like rubbing alcohol. <clears throat> well, that's an absolute no for me mm -hmm. because there are other things that are better than alcohol. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in a black household. Mm -hmm. We were told anytime you get your hair cut or you shave, what do you put in your face? Alcohol. Alcohol. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is helpful because it kills bacteria, which right. can contribute to things, but it's also very toxic to the skin. Like mm -hmm. It can be damaging to the skin. So you might be causing more harm than help. And mm -hmm. So there's so many other things that we can use that won't cause harm mm -hmm. um, that can help fix it. So it's a no for me. Got it. Got it. Randy Jackson. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, something that one of my coworkers said is that putting aloe vera on sunburned skin. For Black Americans, do we get sunburns? And is aloe vera something that we should be using, or should we think about that differently? Have you ever had sunburn? On my nose only, only That's one time. Yeah. <laughs> so I had my first one. I was in um, visiting Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, I was college i didn't know better mm -hmm. shoulders burn really yeah. um never had one before and so the answer to that is yes we do burn mm -hmm. um some of it is depending on where we live you know people who live in the northern states and then visit southern states or states or countries close to the equator mm -hmm. definitely increase risk people who live in sunnier states may not get as many burns because they're constantly getting a uv exposure mm -hmm. but they can still burn depending mm -hmm. on the, the length of exposure mm -hmm. um just because your darker skin doesn't mean that your uh we call med so mineral erythema dose that's kind of what we a scientific term we use to see how much sun you'll get before you start to get red and potentially burn mm -hmm. just because your darker skin doesn't mean that your dose is much higher than the next person and so that's some what of a misconception um, so yes, we do get burns and aloe is, is soothing. Aloe does help, um, calm some of the burning and irritation from, from, uh, sunburn. So I recommend it in the okay. early stages. Got it. And then sunburn. similarly on the same vein, do black people need to wear sunscreen? See, that was my question for you. Oh, man. <laughs> what do you think? I think yes. Why? Because UV rays still affect us whether yeah. we're showing it or not. And so sunscreen is still important. I do wear, wear a face sunscreen at least yeah. every day. So to your point earlier, you said you burn. And mm -hmm. sunscreen is one of the biggest protectants of uh, that we can utilize to prevent burning. Mm -hmm. But a conversation that we don't often have in detail in the dermatology community with Black patients is it's not just about the sun. So a lot of the conditions that we just described, vitiligo, hyperpigmentation, mm -hmm. the use of sunscreen can help you or a patient um, prevent those from worsening mm -hmm. or having issues uh, as a result of like vitiligo. If you have too much sun, you can burn, you can develop skin cancer in the areas where you have the lighter patches. So mm -hmm. sun protection, as I like to call it, goes beyond protection from the sun. Mm -hmm. It can help you. Um, it helps us with treatment. You know, the sun is inflammatory to a certain degree. So if someone has acne and they're getting a lot of sun and it's causing inflammation, well, what's going to happen to that inflammatory acne is going to worsen. Mm -hmm. Hyperpigmentation is inflammation. What happens when you get sun um, or other light exposures mm -hmm. um, when you have hyperpigmentation, it can worsen. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, black don't crack, right? That's what we say. Mm -hmm. Photo aging is still probably the most... Uh, environmentally one of the reasons why we age mm -hmm. we may not develop wrinkles but we might develop blemishes and dark spots and other right. moles and other things mm -hmm. that are related to aging and sunscreen can help slow that down okay. um and then lastly visible lights like our screens on our phones our tvs mm -hmm. blue light mm -hmm. um, there are sunscreens now that have blue light protection because blue light especially in darker skin types can have a negative effects mm -hmm. and so yes black people should wear sun protection got it even if you're not going into the sun that day Correct. necessarily because there's sun everywhere mm -hmm. right there's blue lights everywhere too right, right? Mm -hmm. so we talked about other light sources but the sun refracts right there's a mm -hmm. glass window right next to us that mm -hmm. sun is peeping through mm -hmm. and it is helpful to just get in your routine get a moisturizer with an spf 30 or greater mm -hmm. that's my rule of thumb mm -hmm. use it reapply it if you're out and about don't forget hats don't forget your ears and then most importantly the lips Mm -hmm. So that is a a lot of a, one of the common conditions that I see in African American uh, patients or Black patients is we'll just see, notice darkening of the lips. Mm -hmm. And what causes those lips to get darker? 
this sign. This sign. Yeah. So uh, uh, lip balms and lip um, products with SPF is, is crucial to mm -hmm. prevent that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And speaking toward putting things on your face, mm -hmm. Another colloquial phrase that one of my, my coworkers has heard is that you should not wear makeup because it'll mess up your skin. What do you say to something like that? Well, my goal is I tell patients, I don't, <clears throat> I like to get your skin to the point where you don't need makeup. Mm -hmm. But if you want to wear makeup, that's fine. Mm -hmm. The key with makeup is getting the right type for you, mm -hmm. getting one that is not loaded with a bunch of additives and things that can irritate the skin. Um, making sure you take it off quickly mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. making sure it's not overly used or caked on because mm -hmm. you can, even those makeups that market that they don't clog pores or not comedogenic, you know, if anything's sitting on the face long enough, is there a potential it can clog your pores and cause acne or inflammation? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I would say you can wear makeup in moderation, mm -hmm. make sure it's the right type, make sure you're getting it off mm -hmm. and make sure you're not wearing it to mask something that can be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, that's the biggest thing I see. I mean, I had a young preteen yesterday who was wearing makeup because she had acne. Mm -hmm. Of course, the makeup was making the acne worse, but she didn't want to go to school with acne. Right. Let's fix that. Let's mm -hmm. get you taken care of. Um, and then maybe you'll decide you don't want to wear makeup. Maybe you want to wear a tinted mm -hmm. SPF instead, mm -hmm. which is usually my go-to recommendation. Got it. Okay, good to know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bosley. Thank I you. think this has been a great conversation. So I'm Dr. Ron Bosley, and I'm now included. <laughs>